John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. and welcome back before we get into the episode just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast and all that means is that we are way behind where i'm at in patreon so if you are loving this podcast and you need more john constantine in your life definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books and sign up for the hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire hellblazer library that i've recorded so far and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the planes trains and comic books main podcast so if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 38. And just a little catch up on what's been going on in the last issue. John Constantine and his friend slash sometimes lover Marge and her daughter Mercury have been traveling around the countryside of England in a camper and it has broken down in the middle of nowhere in the countryside And the reason why they're in this area is because Mercury, who is psychic, had like an intuition that she was going to be needed up here to save someone. And her intuition is right because in this same area, there is a man named Archibald, who is a horrible person and also a meat butcher. And he has a son named Martin, who is a nice, soft-spoken vegetarian boy who just turned 18. And he has happened to run into Mercury, and she knows instantly that this is the boy she was here to save. And like I said earlier, the van is broken down, so John and Marge, Mercury's mom, have left Mercury with the van because she wanted to stay, and they have gone off to find some way to fix the van. In the meantime, Martin's dad has picked him up and has taken him to a slaughterhouse where he has intended his son to take up the family business and slaughter all these pigs. And as you can imagine, Martin does not want to do this. He tries to free the pigs, and this pisses off his dad something fierce. So after rounding up all the pigs that had gone out, he begins to start slaughtering them and he actually throws Martin inside the pig pen. And at the same time, Mercury feels Martin's fear. And so she is tracked down where he is at the slaughterhouse and she is running down to try to save him. And that is where we left off in the last issue. So first things first, we got the cover here of issue 38. And this cover is really striking. There's super bright red on it because it's supposed to signify blood. And there is a man standing in between two halves of rib cages, like a pig carcass or something that's kind of enveloping him or trying to suck him in. And there's blood and everything dripping off of these rib bones. So it's pretty messed up cover. It's very striking. If you saw it on the racks, you would for sure pick it up. And we also see on the cover that the writer of this issue is Jamie Delano with art by Steve Pugh. And we start off on the first page with Mercury looking at Martin in the pig pen while all the pigs have just recently been slaughtered and all the men inside the slaughterhouse are cleaning up the guts and offal of the pigs that have been slaughtered. And Mercury ran in here without a plan, so she's kind of paused trying to figure out what to do and the narration says, Fools rush in. Too much haste. Look before you leap. Mercury hadn't expected it to be so strong, so foul, like the fear machine. Instinct triggered by Martin's frantic need, her mind had been wide open as she rushed towards the horror. Her fear is primal, contagious, the paralyzing helplessness of weakness staring at the face of violence. Martin shocked into submission, mind hiding from unreason, a rabbit frozen in the blazing headlights of a car. Mercury's nausea is passing. She feels as if she can breathe again, shut out enough violence to think. The cells are all silent now. The smell of their death hangs as heavy and poignant as their empty bodies swinging in the shed. For the men, though, the slaughter is over far too soon. Their frenzy has peaked prematurely, and now they feel what? Something elusive and disturbing. A disappointment. A raw passion of their violence is satisfied, but a lust for cruelty is left unfulfilled. Like well-fed cats, they turn and stretch out dangerously lazy paws. And in the panel, under that last bit of narration, we see that the men, including Martin's father, are turning and looking at him in the pig pen very, very creepily. And his father goes over to Martin and grabs him by the hair and says, This shitting little runt's hardly worth killing, but if a job's worth doing... And Martin's dad proceeds to take him by the hair and pull him out of the pen, and Archie takes his son, ties his feet up, and hang him upside down from the ceiling. 
And of course, Martin is protesting and yelling and saying don't and no, but his dad just says to the other men, queer things, pigs. Sometimes they almost sound like they're trying to talk. And Martin was wearing like a really thick sweater, so they pull that down over his head so he can't see anything. And the other men in the slaughterhouse, they join in on this, and they begin to use a cattle prod and shock Martin in his stomach area, and then they throw a bunch of blood all over him as he yells no. And one of the men named Charlie says, Come on, boy, don't make it worse. You've got him all fired up now. Take it like a man, or there's no telling what he'll do. And we also see on this page that the name of this issue is called Boys Games. So, of course, while all this is going on, all the people in the slaughterhouse are drinking, including Martin's dad. And Archie, his dad, is in a really, really bad state. Of course, he's drunk, and he's really angry about what his son did trying to free the pigs earlier. So, he takes a knife, kind of like what he did in the last issue to Martin's mom, and he runs it up and down Martin's stomach. And while he does this, he talks to the other men and says, Ugly looking beast, this one, huh? Just skin and bone. A couple of rashes of bacon and the rest is pet food. And the other men here are thinking this is hilarious. <laughs> They're going along with it. And Charlie, the old man, says, Long pig, they call him in the South Seas, boss. So how should we cut her? And Archie says, Like this, I reckon. And he swings the knife and he starts to cut the pants of his son, making it so that Martin's legs are exposed. And the other men think this is hilarious. They're like, ha, Never seen chicken legs on pork before. <laughs> The ministry inspectors wouldn't pass it, that's certain. And then Archie tells the other men in the slaughterhouse to clean his son up. So they take a hose and begin to spray him down with water. And due to all the cuts on his pants, they've just fallen off. So now Martin is in his big sweater that's now soaked with blood and water. And he's hanging upside down in his underwear. And Mercury, who's sneaking around outside, is seeing all of this. And her narration says, They're animals. No, that's unjust. They're men. They're choked by their fear and drowning in a swamp of gore, but they won't go on their own. The damned always demand company. If they suffer, then so must everybody else. Mercury would like to sneak away, to close the memory of this ghastly place in a tight box, in a dark corner of her mind. She'd like to drive its smell from her lungs with clean air, but there isn't any. There can't be. Not while this is going on. And then there's Martin, pulling at her heart. But even if it wasn't him, she'd still have to stay and try. And with that, she decides to stand up and say something, so she yells out, Stop it! And of course, everybody's kind of startled, but they turn around and see her, and Archie looks at her and says, Well, strap me, look at this, the other squealing little shoat. And he looks at the other guys and says, Bit sweeter meat on this one, huh? And he remembers her from before, earlier in the day, when he ran into Martin on the street and took him to the slaughterhouse. And she was a bit rude with him, of course, because he's a jerk. So he walks up to her with a knife in his hand, and he says, didn't I say your hide needed a tanning? And at this, the other men in the in the slaughterhouse, they get a little uh, divided on it. Specifically, Charlie, he puts up a protest. He says, Archie, I, I wouldn't. But some of the other men are fine. They're looking at her saying, I wonder what she'd look like swinging upside down. And another one says, yeah, let's peel her too. But, you know, Mercury's not your average girl, so... <laughs> She can kind of fend for herself. She was in many situations that were really bad in the Fear Machine story arc. So she's able to keep her cool and she actually finds that cattle prod sitting on a table next to her. And as Archie approaches her, she shocks his hand with it and he drops the knife. And Mercury is able to grab it quickly while it's on the ground. And as she picks it up, the dad, who's super mad now at her, yells for his dog Churchill. And if you remember from the last issue, Churchill is like basically a big Rottweiler looking dog or possibly like a Mastiff mix, because he's gigantic, and he is a prize-fighting dog for Archie, and he's super aggressive. So Archie seems okay with this dog possibly mauling her to death. And the other men don't say anything, but Charlie, who was kind of protesting a little bit earlier, says, Boss, you can't. The brutal ripper to pieces. But Archie cuts him off and says, Shut up, Charlie. She shouldn't have come here. Little slut's asking for it. So as Archie says that, Churchill rounds the corner and looks at Mercury and begins to growl. But Mercury, being a bit of an empath, uh, she just kneels down on all fours and looks at the dog. And the dog comes over to her growling, but she just puts her face in his face and smiles. And Churchill just rolls over on his stomach. It seems she's done some kind of psychic hoodoo on the dog. And now he's just kind of like a playful puppy. And Mercury kind of rubs this in. She looks at Archibald and she says... Well, well, he's a lamb, really, isn't he? It'd be a shame to have to gut him. 
And this is obviously like a fake threat because Mercury doesn't want to kill a dog, but she holds the knife up like she might do it. And Archibald is flabbergasted at this. He says, seize her, you useless mutt. And the other men are just standing in awe as well. They don't know what to do. They've never seen Churchill act like this. And Charlie, the old man who's been protesting, he's had enough of this. So he goes over to Martin and he starts to take him down. And Archie asks what he's doing. And Charlie says, I'm letting him down. The joke's gone flat, Archie. Rub your legs, kid. Get the blood moving. We weren't really going to hurt him, girly. It's just our way of making him one of the boys. And Mercury goes over to Martin now that he's kind of loose and sitting up. And she says to Charlie, well, Martin's not one of the boys. He's my friend. Come on, lovey. Take it slow. Lean on me. And then she looks at the dog and says, stay, Churchill. And the dog listens to her. He just sits there and doesn't do anything. And Archie sees this and he's super mad. And he says, useless bloody dog, useless bloody boy, fanny struck, both of them. And if Archibald wasn't in a bad enough mood already, Charlie tries to make a joke and brings up the dog fight that Archie offered him in the last issue. And he says with a big smile on his face, I was wondering, Archie, if it cheer you up, I'll put my dogs up against Churchill there, say for 200 quid. That is, unless you think he's not fit for it now. And Archie doesn't say anything, but he's got a very, very angry look on his face. So that probably wasn't the thing to say at that moment. So Mercury walks Martin all the way back to the camper where she figures they'll wait until John and Marge come back. And Martin is kind of like in a state of shock, almost catatonic. His eyes are completely wide open and he's not saying anything. And Mercury gets him a blanket and starts taking care of him and trying to get him to feel okay again. And as she's doing this, Mercury kind of realizes that this is the same thing that her mother did with John. And she says that this troubles her because it makes her feel like she's a mere image of her mother. And a couple issues back, she hated the way that Marge had taken care of John like this. So it's giving her something to think about as far as her becoming like her mom, which she doesn't really want to do. Then we come back to the slaughterhouse where Charlie and Archie's dogs are fighting. It seems Archie has taken Charlie up on that dog fight and he's not very happy at what's happening because Churchill is losing. And we get a bunch of panels of his face as he's like super angry and watching Churchill underperform and eventually lose and get beaten by Charlie's old dog. And the other men think Charlie is pretty stupid for doing this because they say, Jesus, Mick, look at the boss's face. I wouldn't want to be Charlie right now. And Charlie looks over at Archie with a very smug look on his face and says, I reckon my old dog's done for your Churchill then, Archie. What are you going to do about your animal then? His throat's all chewed out, but he's still breathing. And Archie proceeds to pick up a liquor bottle and smash Churchill's skull until the dog is completely dead. And then he drags Churchill's carcass all the way over to the truck that is now full of offal and pig guts, and he throws the dog's body in it. And while he's doing that, the phone begins to ring in the slaughterhouse, and he goes over and picks it up, and it's his wife. And we don't hear her side of the conversation, but we gather from Archie's side of it that she's asking where Martin is because he hasn't been home yet, and Archie couldn't care less. In fact, it makes him very angry that she's even calling and asking him. And then she asks when he'll be home, and he says, When I bloody feel like it. Don't you worry, you'll know when I get there. And then he hangs up the phone and walks back to the guys who are now playing cards, and he says, Women, suck the life out of a man. And the other guys hear this, and they kind of joke because it's kind of sexual sounding, and they say, <laughs> I wouldn't mind some of that, eh? You gotta treat him right, Archie, like dogs. And the guy who said this is sitting at the table with his back to Archie and Archie kind of sneaks up on him and says, there's only one way to treat him. Stop him spreading their taint. And then he yells, keep him afraid of you. Which scares the bejesus out of that man. And the guy falls over. And with that yell, it seems that Archie has hit his limit. He has snapped and he's got some ideas about how to get revenge on his son and Mercury. So he asks if the truck is full of the guts and the men confirm that it is full, but that they were going to wait till tomorrow to take it to the renderer. But like I said, Archie's got an idea of where he wants to put these guts. So he takes the keys and he leaves. And then we cut to Mercury and Martin who are still in their van. And they're both asleep, but they are waking up by some lights coming down the road. And at first Mercury thinks it's John and Marge maybe. But as it gets closer, she can tell that it is the truck of Martin's dad. And Martin, of course, is freaked out by this, but Mercury is keeping her cool. She's telling Martin that it's okay. He's just trying to scare them. But it becomes apparent that Archie's trying to do more than that because he takes the truck and he backs it up. And this truck has like a hydraulic lift that lets it dump out its contents. So he uses that and he dumps all the guts out all over the van. And the weight of all the pig guts actually smashes through the windows and it gets all inside of it as well. And Archie's thinking this is hilarious. He says, <laughs> meat and mess, boy. That's all you'll find under the skin of beasts and women. 
And then Archie gets out of the truck and walks over to the van, I guess, to try to get Martin. And he's shocked at what he sees because as he approaches, Martin runs out and he looks all crazed and feral and he's yelling and he's got a pig femur in his hand that he's brandishing as a club. And Martin runs over to his dad and says, shut your vile mouth, you mad, ignorant bastard. And he clubs his dad in the face. And that is probably my favorite moment of this whole comic because his dad is a horrible, horrible person. So once his dad is on the ground, Martin continues to hit him with the femur and he's yelling, I've had enough of you. And as he's possibly about to go too far, Mercury grabs his arm and says, Martin, stop it. Stop it now. And this kind of snaps him out of this violent rage he was in. And she looks at Martin and says, it's his violence, love, his disease. Don't you catch it? And she's helping him walk away from his father. And he's turning to her and he says, he deserves it. He needs to be taught. And she answers, but that's not the way to do it. That's man's way. All he'll do is respect you for it. I know a much better way. And then Mercury walks over to Archie and she grabs it by the face and she makes him look into her eyes and she says, don't I, Mr. Butcher? I know what really scares you. And then we cut to a little bit later and he's drinking openly out of a liquor bottle and he's thinking to himself, little slut did something. And he's talking out loud, very drunkly to himself. And he says, God, I'm drunk as a monkey, but I ain't scared. I ain't scared of man or beast. I ain't afraid of no woman neither. Wait till I get home. I'll show that slack old sow. Show all them cows, them bitches. They're all just grunting smelly meat, all of them. But it's my meat, and I'll chop and shape it anyhow I like. Because I'm the cock, and this is where I roost. And as he says that last line, he pulls up to his own house. And then we cut inside the house, where his wife has just been woken up by the sound of his truck, and she looks terrified. And there's an interesting thing in this panel. There's a cup with like dentures in it and she's pretty young. So I think they're insinuating that he has beaten her and punched out all her teeth. So she has to wear dentures because of that. So as she hears him come in the door, the narration says the door slams. He mutters and curses. The smell of awful creeps through the window. Elsie imagines it gusts from her husband's yawning mouth. He'll be in one of his bad black fits. Martin's upset her again and he'll have to take it out on her. He'll be blind, sweaty, drunk. He'll hurt her. She can't stand it anymore. She'll have to hide again. Somewhere different. Perhaps he'll pass out before he finds her this time. And the place that she chooses to hide is Martin's room. She goes into Martin's bed and she curls up under the covers and the narration continues. The bed smells of her son. Her quiet tears seep into his pillow. He'll leave her soon, going out to find himself somewhere safe and quiet, somewhere of his own. She's never had a place like that, not even as a little girl. Always confused and commotion, always some man lumbering and growling about, a rough voice to make her tremble deep inside. So then we cut to the downstairs where Archie is stumbling through the house, shouting up to her saying, I'm home, woman, and I want what's mine. You think I can't get up the stairs, do you? Ha! I'm crocked, but I'm not crippled. And there's some great panels here of the dad who looks horrifying because he's super angry and he's super drunk. And as he's yelling those things out to his wife, he's trying to climb up the stairs. And we, we see the stairs become longer the more he tries to climb up them. And he does eventually make it to the top of the stairs. And we get some narration where he's thinking about Mercury and it says, He pictures the girl reaching out, touching his head. Furious thick anger boils him like stew in a renderer's vat. Pressure cooked flesh scalds from bones, simmering down to glue. He's starting to come unstuck. He needs to explode. She said she knew what scared him. She laughed at him and killed his dog, bedazzled his boy. But it's her who should be scared. All of them should be. All of the sneaking, sniggering cows, they're all in it together. So as he's thinking this, he's actually made it to the top of the stairs and has walked into his bedroom and finds that his wife is not there. And of course, this makes him angry. So he takes off his belt and he begins to like whip it in the air. And he says, come on, you heaving old mare. Your master's home and he wants to ride. Playing hide and bloody seek again. It'll be worse for you when I find you. And as he's saying this, he's walking back down the hall towards the stairs trying to find her. And because he took his belt off, of course his pants are down around his ankles now. And this causes him to trip just as he's passing the stairs. And he actually falls down them. But he doesn't die or anything. He just chuckles to himself as he gets to his knees. And as he looks up while he's on all fours, he sees there's a room with a door open and he hears something in there. So he thinks that's his wife and he goes inside and he says, 
You better bite your tongue, woman. I can hear you whimpering. So he's able to get back to his feet and he kind of shambles over to another door. And this door leads to the cold storage room of his butcher shop, which is part of his house. And he goes inside thinking that his wife is hiding in this cold storage room. And in this room, there's like hanging carcasses of meat and he's pushing his way through all of them. And he eventually makes his way all the way to the back and he sees a woman's legs in fishnets. And he thinks that's his wife and he comes closer. And as he does, he hears a voice say, you've been a bad boy again, haven't you, Archibald? And as this person comes into focus, he yells out loud, oh Lord, because what he's looking at is a half pig, half woman that is dressed in fishnets and high heels and garter belts and a really tight leather corset that's got these spiky appendages off of it that look like pig nipples. And the woman has a pig's face and also has hooved feet inside of the high heels. And she's sitting on a wood butcher's block and she says to him, come here, answer me. Well, and he shambles over to her and she has one of those leather sticks with like a whip at the end and she puts it under his chin and he says, Yes, I've been a bad boy. P please, I'm sorry. And she says, well, I'm afraid that sorry isn't good enough this time. And she proceeds to unlace the front of her corset. And as she does, we can see that her whole chest is split open like a rack of ribs. And she continues, you've hurt me, Archibald. Cut me to the quick. And Archibald's protesting as she does this. But she continues to unlace it until it's finally completely open. And she wraps her legs around Archibald and begins to push him into her chest cavity. And with each panel of her, she's getting more and more horrific. And by the time she's pushing him into her, like her head is almost decapitated and her face has gone way more grotesque and she's spurting blood everywhere. It almost looks like something from the movie Thing, like specifically the scene where one of the guys takes a defibrillator and tries to use it on another guy that's having a heart attack or something. And the chest bursts open and the guy with the defibrillators shoves his hands into the chest and it bites them off. This is kind of like that because her ribs kind of look like teeth and it looks like he's almost being eaten by her chest cavity. And she says to him, there, see, see what a terrible thing you've done to your mother. And Archibald just says, oh God. So what I get from that is the fear that Mercury awakened in him is a fear of his mother and also some mix of that with pigs and murder. And there's also some weird sexual thing wrapped in there with like fetish clothes and whatnot. So then we cut to morning of the next day. And John and Marge are walking in a field on their way back to the van. And they're laughing, talking about what Mercury's probably done to the van because when Marge was a kid, she did a bunch of stuff when her parents left her at the house by herself. And John is sticking up for Mercury saying that she's fine and she can take care of herself and I'm sure she didn't get up to any bad stuff. And as he says that, they round the corner of like a bush and they see the van and it's covered in guts and all the windows are broken and it just looks horrible. And John and Marge are dumbfounded. They don't know what to do. Marge calls out for Mercury while John is just standing there and Mercury and Martin come out of the bushes next to the van and she says, I'm sorry about the mess. Things got a bit wild last night. I thought we'd have time to clear it up before you got back. And this is like a classic scene from like Home Alone or something. Marge is acting like Kevin's mom in that and she's like, clear up, John. And John's like holding her back as she's fuming and he says, if I were you two, I'd just go back to bed for a while. I think your mother needs to have a lie down. And then we cut to a panel of the van just driving away. So it seems like Marge and John were able to get the part they needed and fix it themselves. And Marge, who's still mad and not talking to Mercury, says, John, would you ask my daughter if her friend's staying on the bus or getting off somewhere? And before John can ask, Mercury responds, please tell my mother to stop somewhere near the village. Martin needs to go home. And Marge turns to Martin, and I'm not sure if she's being sarcastic or not, but she says, oh, I hope it wasn't something I said. And Martin says that it's not and that he would like to stay with them, but he can't because his mother is with his dad and he can't leave her with him. And Mercury, who's looking out the window, says, oh, I wouldn't worry about him. But Martin's not really comforted by this because he's just worried about his mom. But then as they're driving, they see a person who's hitchhiking and Martin recognizes her instantly as his mom. So, of course, they stop and they pick her up. And as she gets on, she sees Martin and she says, oh, I see you found yourself some friends then. That's good. I thought I'd go stay with my sister Ethel in Norwich. Are you going near there? And Martin's a little confused and he says, what about dad? And she says, I've left him with the doctors. He's finally gone over the edge, son. I came down this morning and found him in the cool room, half frozen in his underpants, three parts inside of a pork carcass. It made me feel sick, but then again, he always did. And then the mom kind of looks around the van and realizes that all the windows are broken and the windshield is gone. And she says, 
what happened to your window then? And that's the last panel in the comic. And it's pretty funny because it's kind of like the end of like a sitcom or something because Mercury is literally winking at us, which if you think about it is a pretty messed up ending for the type of storyline we just read. So like I said, that is the end of the issue. And if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and common books, all one word at gmail.com. And with that, we will see you on the next one.